This podcast is brought to you by Audible, the world's leading source of audiobooks. Now, I suspect that some of you might be recoiling in horror at the prospect that I will now be pitching you random products from my podcast. But here's a promise. I will never recommend a product or service to you that I don't use myself. Now, I've heard from many of you about the increasing importance of audio in your lives. Many of you have asked for more audio content from me, and that's the reason why I started this podcast. And for years now, I've been hearing from those of you who only buy the audio versions of my books. Now, I've been very slow to understand what's going on here. But now I do, because like many of you, I'm finding it increasingly difficult to set aside large blocks of time to read. And yet reading is absolutely central to my job, and it's one of my greatest sources of pleasure. But there are many times throughout the day, often blocks of an hour or more, where I can listen to lectures or podcasts or audiobooks. Whether you're commuting to work or running errands or working out, audio is the one form of media you can consume while getting other things done. So now I understand the advantages of audiobooks, and I'm very happy to have Audible as a sponsor of this podcast. But they only sponsor this podcast if my listeners try their service. Here's how it works. If you go to audibletrial.com front slash Sam Harris and become a new member of their service, the first month will be free, which means you get a free audiobook. You can cancel your membership at any time, but if you don't cancel it after the first month, you'll be able to download a new book each month for $14.95. Now, if you don't like a book for whatever reason, you can exchange it for another one. So there really is zero risk of disappointment here. You can try a membership for one month for free and get a free audiobook, even one of my books, like Waking Up. Then you can cancel this membership, keep the book, and you won't be charged a dime. And even if you wind up canceling after this first free month, you will still have supported this podcast. But if you continue to use the service, as I think you will, you can return any books you don't like and exchange them for new ones. It's a great service, and I think you'll like it as much as I do. In fact, when I really want to get a book into my brain these days, I usually buy the print or electronic edition and the audio. So I read it when I can read it, and I listen to it at other times throughout the day. It's just incredibly efficient and enjoyable. So if you'd like to support this podcast, please give Audible a try at audibletrial.com forward slash Sam Harris. Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Today I'm going to talk about cults, mostly. I've been in a cultish frame of mind in the last week, getting over bronchitis, so my uh, apologies for my voice being even raspier than it usually is. But I've been um, paying attention to cults for some reason, and I've focused on two cults that have been around for a while, uh, Heaven's Gate and Scientology. I recently saw the film Going Clear based on Lawrence Wright's book by that name. And um, the book is well worth reading. The the film is really a a devastating takedown of Scientology. I can't imagine it won't do the organization lasting harm if enough people see it. It just exposes how goofy L. Ron Hubbard was and how sinister his organization soon became under him and his successors. So uh, do see that film. It's playing on HBO and had some theatrical release as well. But I've mostly been thinking about the Heaven's Gate cult, which, as you might recall, about 18 years ago, came to the world's attention because 39 members, including the chief member, a man named Marshall Applewhite, who was known as Doe to his devotees, all took their lives in a mansion near San Diego. They all donned identical pairs of Nikes and drank a cocktail of phenobarbital and vodka, I believe, and then got in their bunk beds and covered themselves with purple shrouds and departed, they imagined, for a spaceship that was following in the tail of the comet Hale-Bopp. So this was a rather horrifying and peculiar news item. I I think it remains the largest mass suicide in U.S. history, although I recall my reaction to it at the time was a little bit less than reverential. I remember sitting on my couch watching this first footage that came out of this house of everyone in their bunk beds with their Nikes and hearing the voiceover announcer say, and in their freezer they had nothing but quart after quart of Starbucks Java Chip ice cream. 
And I remember sitting on my couch alone and saying out loud to myself, wait a minute, Starbucks makes ice cream? And, and then I leapt to my feet and drove straight to the supermarket and uh, bought some Starbucks Java chip ice cream. So, um, so I, I guess we all draw from certain tragedies the, the lessons we need at the time. Uh, obviously, I've become more sympathetic with the plight of these people in the intervening years and more interested in the phenomenon of cults and have drawn uh, other lessons from this one. In any case, the most fascinating thing about Heaven's Gate is that the members of this class, as they called it, left final video testimonies as to why they were doing what they were doing and how satisfied they were to be doing it. And this is, of course, analogous to the video testimonies one often gets from jihadist suicide bombers. But these were people who were really aware of how inscrutable their behavior was going to seem to their loved ones and to the rest of the society in which they were living. And they really made their best effort to defend their actions, if not explain them, and to, to simply bear witness or, or demand that the world bear witness to the psychological fact that they were absolutely unconflicted in doing what they were doing. They just felt immense gratitude for the experience of living for decades with their other cult members with whom they had formed an obvious bond, and for the guidance of Doe and T, the, the woman who had been his partner, who had died a decade earlier. And uh, these were people who, for the most part, were clearly happy and approaching their deaths with genuine enthusiasm. They were, they were gleeful about the prospect of departing this world and arriving elsewhere in the galaxy. So these videos are really an amazing document, and I was tempted to put some audio uh, in this podcast, but it, there, there really is no substitute for seeing the videos themselves, so I will embed those on my blog. And um, there's about two hours of video. Uh, there's additional hours of Doe himself giving his final testimony, and um, that's also fascinating to watch. But the videos of the, the cult members are really... Um, profoundly strange and unnerving when you see just how sanguine they are about the, their whole project, which is, you know, on its face, really the most profligate misuse of human life imaginable. These are people who lived in total isolation for decades under the sway of obviously crazy ideas, depriving themselves of most of life's experience, and these are people who had abandoned children, they had abandoned uh, the rest of their families, and abandoned every other human project that we might deem worthy of a person's attention and energy, and then killed themselves in the most carefree state of mind. And it was entirely the result of what they believed about the nature of the soul, about the nature of the kingdom of heaven, about the, the hideous condition of the world, and about the coming apocalypse that Doe assured them was um, imminent, and uh, that this represented their last chance to migrate to the kingdom of heaven. If they didn't seize it now, everything would be lost. So these videos really are quite unique, and above all, they offer an insight into just what it's like to be totally convinced of paradise. The most shocking thing about this, well, there are a few things. One is the undeniable fact that most of these people were clearly happy uh, in some basic sense. You, you struggle to detect in their faces and in their deliveries some clue to their deeper psychopathology. And in many cases, um, I think you will come up entirely empty. Now, these people bear all the signs of having spent, in, in, as most of them had, 20-plus years living in total isolation from the world. Uh, most of these people had been part of this cult since the, the mid-70s, and they, this is, was in 1997 that they killed themselves. They all wore identical, uh, uh, terrible haircuts and all had androgynous clothing that they buttoned up to the neck. 
I believe they uh, they shared all their clothing in common, including underwear. Uh, so they had a, a dogma of non-attachment that was operating here that led to a kind of self-effacement at the level of their presentation. They were all wore equally terrible eyeglasses, uh, those who needed them, like they all wandered into a lens crafters and just asked for the worst pair of glasses that could possibly be pulled out of the box. So th there's something about these people. They are misfits of a sort. And it's uh, tempting to imagine that they were socially marginalized to a degree that somehow explains how they were recruited into this circumstance and therefore how they met their end. But that's not to say that these aren't happy, intelligent, uh, relatively high-functioning people uh, who could have succeeded in other contexts in life. Uh, and I think that's to some degree obviously true of some of them. One thing is clear that many of these people were parents who entirely abandoned their children to join Doe and T and submit their lives to this experiment, which, um, when you look in, at the details, is rather shocking to consider. It's shocking especially because uh, when you listen to the teachings of Doe, you can also watch hours of video where he describes uh, all that he knows about the workings of the universe. Some of this video, at least an hour of it, is his final testament given with the full knowledge that they're going to commit suicide in the coming days. And, and in watching Doe's performance here, I think you'll also look in vain for a an obvious reason why people would give their lives over to this man. A few things are, are conspicuous. One is is the total absence of compelling intellectual content. This is not a brilliant person. He's not bowling you over with his ability to connect ideas or to turn phrases. Uh, the only clue to his powers of mesmerism is um, his quality of eye contact, which, I, as I discuss at one point in my book, Waking Up, is, some, is a feature you find in gurus in general, and in people who are making heroic efforts to persuade. And in Doe, this is, this is conspicuous. The man rarely blinks. He's looking at a camera lens for this video, but one can well imagine that this is the style of eye contact he used when talking to people directly. Maybe I'll offer a brief digression on this topic. There's actually a section in my book, Waking Up, where I talk about eye contact, and uh, I'll just read it to you. A person's eyes convey a powerful illusion of inner life. The illusion is true, but it is an illusion all the same. When we look into the eyes of another human being, we seem to see the light of consciousness radiating from the eyes themselves. There's a glint of joy or judgment, perhaps. But every inflection of mood or personality, even the most basic indication that a person is alive, comes not from the eyes but from the surrounding muscles of the face. If a person's eyes look clouded by madness or fatigue, the muscles orbicularis oculi are to blame. And if a person appears to radiate the wisdom of the ages, the effect comes not from the eyes, but from what he or she is doing with them. Nevertheless, the illusion is a powerful one, and there is no question that the subjective experience of inner radiance can be communicated with the gaze. It is not an accident, therefore, that gurus often show an unusual commitment to maintaining eye contact. In the best case, this behavior emerges from a genuine comfort in the presence of other people, and a deep interest in their well-being. Given such a frame of mind, there may simply be no reason to look away. But maintaining eye contact can also become a way of, quote, acting spiritual, and therefore an intrusive affectation. There are also people who maintain rigid eye lock not from an attitude of openness and interest, or from any attempt to appear open and interested, but as an aggressive and narcissistic show of dominance. Psychopaths tend to make exceptionally good eye contact. Whatever the motive behind it, there can be a tremendous power in an unwavering gaze. Most readers will know what I'm talking about. But if you want to witness a glorious example of the assertive grandiosity that a person's eyes can convey, watch a few interviews with Osho. I never met Osho, but I've met many people like him, and the way he plays the game of eye contact is simply hilarious. I confess that there was a period in my life, after I first plunged into matters spiritual, when I became a nuisance in this respect. Wherever I went, no matter how superficial the exchange, I gazed into the eyes of everyone I met as though they were my long-lost lover. No doubt many people found this more than a bit creepy. Others considered it a stark provocation. But it also precipitated exchanges with complete strangers that were fascinating. 
With some regularity, people of both sexes seem to become bewitched by me on the basis of a single conversation. Had I been peddling some consoling philosophy, or been eager to gather students, I suspect that I could have made a proper mess of things. I definitely glimpse the path that many spiritual impostors have taken throughout history. Interestingly, when one functions in this mode, one quickly recognizes all the other people who are playing the same game. I had many encounters wherein I would meet the eyes of a person across the room, and suddenly we were playing War of the Warlocks, two strangers holding each other's gaze well past the point that our primate genes or our cultural conditioning would ordinarily countenance. Play this game long enough and you begin to have some very strange encounters. I don't remember consciously deciding to stop behaving this way, but stop I did. In any case, I think Doe was probably a master of the unblinking gaze, and this may account for why he had the effect he did on people, because I can tell you, having read some of his writing, if you can call it that, and listened to him speak about his doctrine, there's nothing in the text of what he says that should have compelled people to follow him, much less follow him into their graves. Uh, and he persuaded people to follow him with surprising suddenness. There's an account of one of his early meetings, I think in the, in the early 70s, where something like 20 people from a single lecture dropped their lives and disappeared from Portland or Seattle, or wherever this talk happened, leaving their kids and their parents and their friends just aghast and followed this man into the wilderness. Uh, so something was going on, and I don't know if it's the cologne he was wearing or the way he was boring holes into people's heads with his eyes, but the man had something that people found profoundly attractive. So I, I think I should just give a brief account of what Doe was teaching people. Uh, he claimed to be an extraterrestrial who inhabited his body, the, the body of Marshall Applewhite, at some point in adulthood, and he also claimed to be the same uh, reincarnate personality who had been Jesus and who had gathered apostles, many of whom were now in the, the Heaven's Gate class. Uh, so uh, he had had uh, this project previously of trying to bring people to the kingdom of heaven, to the level above human, uh, as the person of Jesus, but had failed because he had had the bad luck of getting crucified. So now he was back delivering the wisdom of the ages. But now he could deliver it with a modern gloss. Now he could take into account the immensity of the universe and the existence of technology like spacecraft. And now the kingdom of heaven was a place elsewhere in the physical universe that could be reached by dying at this most opportune time. Originally he had suggested that, that spaceships would actually land on Earth and physically take people to this intergalactic space station uh, where the level of above human was being lived out by aliens. But uh, now, since the spaceships didn't land, and they had, they had waited for years and years for the spaceships to land, uh, but since they, they didn't, now the way to get to the spaceship, which was trailing the comet Hale-Bopp, was to die and leave the physical body. And all of, the, all of these years of living in isolation was a preparation for the soul to take its place in this kingdom above human. And that, this, th these were the teachings from the beginning. I, I don't think suicide was ever spoken of in the beginning because, again, they, they expected aliens to land and spirit them away on flying saucers. But death was often talked about as a possible way to get to the kingdom of heaven. In fact, cult members talk about hoping to provoke their own assassination in, in how they, they represented the teachings in front of fundamentalist Christians. They hoped that, that Christians would find their views so offensive that they would kill them and then engineer their, their escape to the next level. Uh, and Doe and T talked often, uh, they, they believed based on uh, I believe prophecy in, in the book of Revelation, they, they thought they were the two witnesses from Revelation. They thought they would be martyred and brought to the kingdom of heaven that way. So death was always kind of working in the background, and the idea was simply to live life in such a way as to divorce oneself from all human mammalian, as he put it, appetites, and prepare the soul to take a non-human form 
on a spaceship. What I think is so interesting about this phenomenon and what can be seen so clearly by looking at the, uh, these tapes is the role that belief played in driving this behavior. This behavior is totally uninterpretable but for the beliefs that these people espouse. And given these beliefs, it seems to make a rather clear sense. Looking at these tapes is a corrective to the crazy denials we hear from so many journalists and pseudo-journalists and social scientists and politicians on the link between belief and action in a religious context. So many people talk about religious beliefs as though they simply do not lead to behavior that they're somehow different from other sorts of beliefs. But, of course, we must know this isn't true. Uh, and yet so many people pretend to know otherwise. Well, you can't pretend here. There's nothing apart from belief. No other variable explains this behavior. What they did was as straightforward as going to the candy store, given what they believed. So these exit interviews are a kind of microscope for the relevant psychology. Here. And when you map this on to the phenomenon of jihadism, in particular the phenomenon of suicide bombing that we see throughout the Muslim world, uh, then the centrality of belief becomes obvious. And all of the obscurantism of people like Scott Atran and Karen Armstrong and Reza Aslan stands revealed for what it is, a denial of the obvious. So one can use cults as a kind of lens through which to view the phenomenon of the, of the true believer. And of course, every religion is a kind of cult. It just has more subscribers. That, that's how we differentiate cults and religions. If you have millions of subscribers, you're a religion. If you have a thousand, or in this case, 40, you're a cult. Now, it's true that being in a tiny minority and having to set yourself in opposition to the rest of your culture and to the religion of your birth, uh, that will tend to select for the truest of the true believers, the most credulous, the most committed people. Uh, so cult members have, almost by definition, something in common with what we call religious extremists in the context of a religion. The buy-in is greater for a cult. To be the type of person who's going to drop everything for a religion focused on UFOs, as was the case with Heaven's Gate, that takes a certain kind of person. And when you look at these people, you see some of the aberration of all that. I mean, these are essentially like the most fanatical people at a Star Trek convention uh, who also happen to believe in the rapture. The Venn diagram of cognitive commitments here is Trekkie and people who took the Left Behind novel seriously. But you also should remember that you're watching people who are about to die. Uh, these are people who are planning to commit suicide in the next few days. And uh, they are telling you why. And they're telling you how this fits into their worldview. And it, it is fascinating to see. And it's, it's quite tragic when you think of how these people used their lives. Uh, when you think of the children and parents and other family members they abandoned. And when you finally grok the fact that these were not all mentally ill people. These were people merely in the grip of specific ideas. What's interesting about the behavior of this group, in fact, is that up until the time they killed themselves, what they were doing was not that far from things that I've done, or at least for months at a time, never years. But during my 20s, I spent about two years on silent meditation retreats in increments of up to three months. And these were, without question, some of the most productive and valuable months of my life. And the best meditation teachers I ever studied with were people who had truly spent decades in isolation, in some cases literally 20 years in a cave. So it's not isolation itself that is synonymous with the, the wastage of one's life. What one believes one is doing in isolation matters a lot. If you go into isolation for a year, just you hole yourself up in an apartment uh, in some city with a dozen Barbie dolls, and you think that by the power of your concentration on these objects, you're going to turn them into real little girls. Okay, you're just a crazy pervert. This is not, you know, isolation can obviously become a circumstance of unethical delusion. And 
in the case of Heaven's Gate, it was clearly a circumstance of delusion. All of their discipline was anchored to the project of attenuating their humanity so fully that they would be welcomed aboard a spaceship. Uh, and part of this project uh, was consummated by the, at least the men by going to Tijuana and having themselves castrated. Eight of the men in this group, including Doe, the leader, had themselves castrated so that they could best resist the siren song of their own endocrine system and forget about sexuality entirely. And because of what they believed about the soul and where they were going after the death of their bodies, they felt truly lucky to be who they were. They were leaving a sinking ship and felt true compassion for all of the confused people like ourselves who didn't have the good sense to get off it. But the horror, of course, is that they were wrong, right? Their, their beliefs were almost certainly false in every respect. And this is the, the horror of religion generally. This is the horror of Islamism and jihadism. And again, the, the, what is central to the phenomenon, the thing that makes it so horrible and yet so captivating to true believers, is this promise of paradise, is the idea that most of what is good in any individual's existence is the part that comes after death. That is really the claim that just leeches all the value out of this world. For instance, Jokar Sarnayev, the surviving Boston Marathon bomber, rode on the side of the boat where he was finally captured, Know you are fighting men who look into the barrel of your gun and see heaven. How can you compete with that? That's what we're dealing with, this expectation of paradise. I recently read an interview with a former ISIS fighter, and he spoke about this same thing, about being motivated by his concern for the afterlife, which he called, quote, the surest part of life. The surest part of life. This is the thing you can most count on. This, this is the repository of most value. But of course, it's not the surest part of life. It's at best an hypothesis founded on nothing. But this is exactly the sentiment you get from the Heaven's Gate members. They're talking about how happy they will be when they finally get to the level above human. The kingdom of heaven. Look at what is going on in the Middle East. Look at the behavior of a group like ISIS. Look at the Western recruits who by the thousands are coming to fight alongside these guys. And recognize that whatever diversity of their backgrounds, whatever other variables we, th we are told account for this behavior, simply realize that these people also believe what they say they believe. And that belief, in their case too, is the primary driver of behavior. And these, that these people, who now in the case of ISIS are murdering apostates and seeking to murder vast numbers of their enemies, these people are just as eager to die and just as unconflicted about the, the apparent misuse of their lives in this world, just as expectant of eternity as the class members of Heaven's Gate were. And when you have that epiphany, you'll be in a position to see how confused most people are by current events. So much of what passes for an analysis of Islamism and jihadism at this moment skates across this psychological fact or denies it outright, looking for other reasons for this phenomenon. And whatever contributions these other reasons might make, whatever contributions U.S. foreign policy, or a legacy of colonialism, or the lack of integration of Muslims in Western Europe might play. The basic fact, the fact at the, at the core of the phenomenon, held and held deeply, is the belief in paradise. The belief that death is an illusion, and that this world, therefore, can be forsaken. In fact, its purpose is to be forsaken. And unless one has some countervailing philosophy that demands a truly ethical engagement with this world, it seems that a belief in paradise makes a person capable of anything. Nothing can go wrong. You can blow up crowds of children and you're doing them a favor. 
That's what makes this type of religious certainty so terrifying. And the impulse to deny its power, to deny that it is even operating, is more terrifying still. In lying to ourselves about the motivations of these people, we are sleepwalking toward a precipice. Perhaps it's time we all woke up. This podcast is brought to you by Audible, the world's leading source of audiobooks. So if you'd like to support this podcast, please give Audible a try at audibletrial.com forward slash Sam Harris.